Okay. Uh, so I guess we'll get started. Is that all right with you, Ashley? Okay. And let's see. I may or may not have the Wait, Sherry, you are, you are muted. Yep, I just unmuted myself. Sorry. Let's, no, that's okay. Let's see if I can move it forward, the slides forward myself. Little time lag in, looks like, maybe not. So I'm gonna have to ask you, Ashley, to forward the slide for me. Okay, so we're so glad that you could join us today. Um, I see a lot of Allegheny County and Garrett County folks out there. Shout out to you all. And of course, we're glad to have everyone here participating with us. And uh, we'd just like to let you know that we are part of University of Maryland Extension. Extension is part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources for the University of Maryland. We are a land grant college. And as such, uh, we do outreach programming into each county of the state. Next slide, please. And there are several um, topics that our Master Gardener volunteers like to do uh, classes on. That includes Grow It, Eat It, which we would consider today's class a Grow It, Eat It class, teaching people about how to grow their own food. Uh, there are Baywise programs, pollinator, composting native plant, programs, as well as uh, we often like to go to farmers markets or other events and have information booths or plant clinics where you can bring your diseased plants or insects and ask our master gardeners for their valuable information on, on uh, how to deal with these things. Next slide. So um, as being a land grant university, we do receive federal funding. And uh, because of that, we um, our, fun, our funders want you to know that we have, uh, we try to offer our programs in a non-discriminatory way and that you have the right to access our programming and any accommodations if necessary. And we are also required to collect demographic information from our participants so that we can ensure that our funders, that our programs are delivered in a, an equitable way. So we're gonna get ready to do a poll. And now this poll is voluntary, but we do hope that you'll um, take a moment to identify yourself. Um, and in doing this, you're helping us to measure our effectiveness in uh, inclusive programming, making our, our programming available to all. So we'll just go ahead and take a couple minutes to do that. And Ashley is gonna Launch the poll. Okay, everybody should see it up on their screen. Uh, there are six questions, so if you um, would be so kind as to answer those and then at the bottom hit submit, um, we will move on to the rest of our program in just a, a little bit. While y'all are doing that, I'll just uh say what a beautiful day it here it is here. I'm actually in Garrett County at the moment and I got the windows open and enjoying the, the sunshine and the, and the fresh air. So I hope all of you fellow gardeners are able to get out there and take advantage of this lovely weather sometime today. It is beautiful after what seems like a long spring in the way uh, yeah. it, it seems nice to, to see some sunshine and warm weather. Absolutely been having frequent snowfalls here in Garrett County, but it doesn't last long. So I guess that's a, a good thing. Definitely, especially this time of year. We're all ready to get out there and get in, dig in the soil, right? Definitely. All right, Sherry, it looks like we have 95% participation. So I will go ahead and end the poll. We can okay. move on. Very good. I'll hand it over to you then. All right, thank you for that introduction. 
So we are going to be talking today about warm season crops. Uh, so these are going to be um, the beans and peas are mainly what we're going to be focusing on, but because they are in that warm season family, uh, these are going to be plants that are going to do best in that 65 to 95 degree weather. Uh, so here in Garrett County, our frost free date is June the 5th. Uh, so that means that prior to that, beans are not going to do very well outside. Uh, so you could, you know, we're going to tell you how to get a jump on the season um, here in a little bit, but uh, peas are uh, plants that are more in the cool season side of things. So uh, they can be started early. Um, so we're going to be talking about both of those today. Uh, so some of the other plants in this family, so we're going to talk extensively about green beans and bush and pole beans, a little bit about um, lima beans and a, a good bit about peas. Uh, but there are some other really cool plants in this family that we wanted to just hit briefly on. So we are studying legumes today. So those plants that can fix their own nitrogen, which is a really neat trait. So they're actually able to capture nitrogen out of the air. And Sherry's going to tell us all about that uh, process after in just a little bit. Uh, but <clears throat> all of the plants in this family are able to do that. So there might be some um, plants listed on this slide that you are surprised to see. So things that are in full bloom uh, right now would be red buds. So if you think about the, the seed pod that they get, it looks similar to a bean. So that kind of makes sense that um, they are in the legume family. Um, other things that might surprise you would be like lupines, uh, red bud, mimosa, locust and honey locust, uh, even things like alfalfa and clover. Uh, because they are legumes, they are uh, highly sought after by a lot of farmers for their field because they can again fix nitrogen so that's one less input or nutrient that farmers need to to apply to their fields whenever they have uh, clover and alfalfa in them. So lots of beautiful plants that are not so not just edible but um, also add a lot of beauty to our garden. So something to think about and hopefully maybe you would get inspired to try one of these other plants. Uh, up here in the right corner would be uh, sweet peas and they would be more of a perennial or they self seed themselves. So they're a great addition to vegetable gardens uh, or perennial gardens. Lupines here on the bottom middle right, uh, red bud, uh, mimosa, and then down here on the bottom would be wisteria, which can kind of be a little aggressive, as you probably know. Uh, there are a few others on this list, like kudzu, uh, which is also very aggressive um, and considered to be invasive in a lot of places. So just be careful whenever you are adding new plants to your garden. Uh, but just be aware that a lot of these plants are going to act very similar to the beans and peas that we're going to talk about later today. So as normal, we are going to start off with this planning chart. Uh, this is for Central Maryland, so we need to think about taking all of these lines and moving them to the right uh, about two weeks to get more of a Western Maryland, Garrett and Allegheny feel for when you should be timing and planning these things. Uh, so as you can see, the first two on the list, beans, lima, and beans snap. Uh, they're not going to really do very well in our area outside until, you know, probably the beginning of June. Um, in Allegheny County, probably mid-May. Uh, Sherry, you can correct me if that doesn't sound quite right, but we're getting to the point where we need to be thinking about when we're going to plant these, uh, these warm season crops. And then if we go to the next page, we see our peas. Uh, so peas, they can go in the ground a good bit earlier. So here in Garrett County, I would say, you know, mid-April, so right around now, they would do okay. And the problem with peas is that they're cold hardy, but their flowers aren't. So if you put them out too early and their flowers get frosted back, there goes all of your pea harvest. So just something to think about there. So what are some reasons to grow legumes? Uh, so if you are taking this class, you probably are already interested in them. My favorite reason is because they are really, really easy to grow. Uh, they do well in most all environments, so they are not a difficult crop to grow. Uh, the seeds are generally pretty affordable, so they're, they're cheap to buy. Uh, and a lot of times these plants can be harvested multiple times throughout the season. So you plant them once and they're going to continue to bloom as long as you keep you know, them free of weeds and diseases uh, and insect pests that Sherry is going to talk about towards the end of this class. 
The other thing about them is that uh, you get relatively large amounts for a small area. And because you can pick them multiple times, uh, it's the kind of the plant that keeps on giving. Uh, they're also very easy to preserve for later on in the season if you wanted to do that. So freezing them or canning them, um, even drying them or pickling them, uh, that's a great option to do with a lot of the plants in this family. So some planting basics, just like most of our vegetables, uh, they need direct sun at least six hours. The more sunlight, the better they're going to produce. Uh, you know, six to eight inches of loose fertile soil. So they really like, you know, loose soil because again, they can fix their own nitrogen, but they do need a pretty large amount of phosphorus potassium. So, you know, think about your soils that are gonna be fairly fertile and that's where you're gonna to wanna to try to plant these plants. Note, uh, we put this here in red because it is important that if you plant them too early, uh, they are really, really big seeds, you know, they're not, tiny microscopic like we think about with a lot of our other uh, garden plants. Uh, so they, they are more likely to rot or to um, you know, be attacked by certain other soil dwelling bugs or organisms. So you don't wanna put them out there until it's gonna be a time that they're gonna be ready to germinate. So some planting tips, um, you, can, you can use almost anything because they are large seeds, it's easier for you to just dig a hole or you know, make a row and drop that in. Uh, there are some other ways that you can do it. Uh, this is a homemade PVC pipe planter uh, that I made a couple uh, years ago. So it's really easy, just a couple elbows and a T uh, where you, would, you can exchange this length for different uh, spacing in between your um, seeds, but basically this makes the hole. Uh, you drop the bean down through the top and then when you pick it up, it's already seeded. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, digging a separate hole and dropping each seed, bending over and, and doing it that way. So that's kind of a fun low input way to, uh, to do this direct seeding. Uh, again, you can, whenever you move this up, then this is your marker hole so you know exactly how far apart uh, to get your beans in. This works well for beans and peas. Uh, the other way that we've always um, done a lot of these direct seed plants, so anything from beets to corn to uh, peas and beans, is with this Earthway seeder, which is this particular brand. Uh, but if you're thinking about doing this a lot, it may be a good investment. They're right around $100, so it is fairly expensive, but it's something that you can use for, again, a lot of different plants because they have these interchangeable um, plates. So you can match whatever size seed you're planting uh, with the plate that, that is appropriate. And then as you push it, one little seed uh, drops out every so often. So that's kind of a cool tool if you're looking to make an investment in uh, vegetable gardening. Uh, I'll go back just real quick. Uh, one other way that you can seed a lot of these uh, legumes is that you can do multiple rows fairly close together. Uh, this helps to create shade and can help with weeds. Uh, so you can put like three rows within an 18 inch, you know, space, sow them every six inches uh, between the rows. And then uh, that's one way that you can kind of help with keeping weeds down. And another way that you can get a head start on the season is by soaking your seeds. So you don't want to soak them for more than 12 hours. Uh, but if you put them in a shallow container of water, this is a great way for them to absorb enough moisture so that they'll break germination a little bit faster once you put them out in the garden. Uh, you can also uh, pre-germinate them on wet paper towels. Sherry was telling me when we were preparing that uh, she does this with her um, her peas. So I don't know if you want to mention anything about that, Sherry, right now. Um, yeah, I, I had actually had a master gardener uh, suggest that to me, and it really works because, you know, here in uh, Garrett County, soils tend to be wet and um, there tend to be clay type soils. So a lot of times I would plant my pea seeds, you know, maybe April, and uh, I wouldn't get very good germination. And I think it's probably because they basically rotted in the soil. The soil was probably too cold and too wet. So um, now I wait a little bit longer to plant. And then I, I do what you were saying, Ashley. I, I soak them for uh, a few hours and then put them between some damp paper towels inside of a plastic bag. And in a couple of days, they will germinate and the little 
um, root will start to grow. And then I take them out and gently place them in my, uh, my furrow that I made. And it seems to work a lot better for me now. So thank you to Donna Gates for that suggestion. Well, that's the best part about gardening is uh, getting to share your, your tips and tricks and things that work well. Uh, so you can also uh, start them just like you would like a tomato or pepper um, because we generally plant large amounts of green beans or snap beans or peas. Uh, that can kind of be a pain. So I wouldn't recommend starting every one of your seeds um, this way because you're going to have a lot of time in transplanting them. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, a way that you can get a jump on the season for a few early uh, beans or peas. Some additional um, growing tips, uh, because again, they make their own nitrogen. Uh, you don't have to worry about applying that. And too much nitrogen can actually uh, make them grow too much plant and not enough uh, beans. So that can kind of be um, a reason, another reason that you wanna stay away from putting too much nitrogen on these plants. Another tip we have is to um, install drip irrigation. This is just an example of what that would look like where you have your drip irrigation lines. Uh, you can get different spacing on the drip irrigation lines. Usually it's six, eight or 12 inches. Uh, so just depending on, you know, for beans, you wanna get them fairly close, probably four to six inches apart um, or maybe even a little bit closer than that uh, whenever you're, you're seeding those in a row. This is a great way to save some time and energy uh, because it's going to, again, get the, the water right where it needs to go. It can also cut down on uh, diseases because, again, the water is going to stay right at the soil level and it's not going to have to worry about splashing on the, the leaves or uh, something like that if you're going to water it with a, a water hose or something, a watering can. Uh, the other thing you can do with beans is you can put them on a trellis, uh, especially pole beans. Uh, this makes them easier to water and fertilize. And it also can add some you know, interesting structure to your, your vegetable garden. Uh, it also can create some space of, for shady loving plants. So wherever your trellis is gonna be on the opposite side where the shade is gonna be, you could plant things like spinach and lettuce that maybe you wouldn't be able to plant later in the season. And another uh, way that you can do this is through companion planting. And one of the popular ways with beans is the Three Sisters Garden. Uh, and a lot of these pictures came from uh, Mother Earth News and then also um, the Farmer's Almanac. But with the Three Sisters, you plant your corn, which is nitrogen loving. Uh, and we use that as the nature's pole. You plant a pole bean at the base and then you would plant squash or pumpkins uh, to help with shading it. So every part of the system is gaining something from this um, relationship. So again, the corn acts as the pole uh, for the bean to grow up, the bean creates nitrogen uh, by capturing that out of the air, uh, which the corn loves, so it benefits there. And then the squash is gonna help to conserve uh, water and to help keep the weeds down. So that's a good way to use space. And then every part of the system is gonna benefit from, from this type of uh, planting. So we're gonna break down uh, beans and peas into two different sections. And we're gonna talk about beans first. Uh, so in general, uh, it's plants in the Fabacea family uh, that are going to be beans and peas. And green beans are going to be when we harvest the unripe fruit. And generally with a green bean, uh, they are going to be eating the pod and the bean together. And a lot of times, again, you want to harvest them early enough that the bean is not going to be uh, pushing out on the pod uh, for most varieties. If you let the beans get too big, then they're going to get more woody and not be nearly as tasty. So bush beans or snap beans are the first type we're going to talk about. So as the name suggests, these are going to be plants that are pretty short in stature. Uh, lots of different types, anywhere from um, you know, purple potted to yellow potted, um, lots of different pretty uh, varieties out on the market now. Uh, but there's a lot of just standard bush green beans or snap beans. So these are, again, very easy to grow. If you've never tried any plants in this family, this is where I'd recommend that you start. Uh, they have a fairly quick turnaround time. So anywhere from 50 to 60 days from the time you seed them. So that's, that's pretty quick for a vegetable. And again, as long as the plant continues to flower, 
uh, so you keep it well watered and uh, fertilized, uh, it will continue to, to produce beans, you know, two or three times probably throughout the growing season where you'll be able to harvest them. And some of our favorite green bean varieties uh, that Sherry and I came up with, uh, so they're usually broken down into three sections. So we have stringless, uh, stringed, or then uh, pole beans. Uh, so your stringless, some of the varieties we like are Blue Lake, Jade, or Tenderette. Uh, stringed varieties are considered half runners. We're going to talk a little bit more about them. Uh, again, these are going to have strings on every one of the pods. So a lot of people absolutely love the flavor. Uh, so they're willing to do that extra step of, you know, removing uh, this the string, but uh, that's just a forewarning that, that they are going to be uh, a little bit more work. <laughs> and then, of course, the pole beans, which are going to have to be staked one way or the other. Uh, so uh, Sherry, she has grown these purple ones, and I could let her, um, you know, pronounce this name if she wants to. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a fun one. I got it. Um, I, st I wanted to try it because I was trying to make, you know, eating fun for the kids. And I thought, ooh, we'll try some purple beans. And um, so I saw these in a catalog and I tried them. I was very pleased with them. They, um, they're they uh, an Italian bean. They're called Trianfo Violetto. And they're probably a little flatter than the other um, bush beans or pole beans, but they have a, um, a kind of a nutty flavor and they don't get stringy. And I would tell my kids that they were magic beans and I would pick them and they're purple when you pick them. And then when you put them in the boiling water, they turn green and I'd have them watch that. So they thought that was a lot of fun. So I just wanted to point that out that it's, you know, it's just um, a fun, different kind of thing to try as well as the rattlesnake bean, a little different than you might be used to. Um, it's got a, a mottled purple and green pod. Um, it, it's a fairly good producer, has a nice flavor. Um, you don't want to get it want it to uh, get too long because then it does get a little tough you know, got to keep an eye on it but another fun and different one to try perfect thank you sherry and uh the last one i have there on the pole bean list is it's called vortex and it's a commercial variety that we have grown in our high tunnel uh, we usually use it as in succession planning so we put it in as a second crop like after our uh cauliflower broccoli comes out and it makes a really nice bean again they're they're pretty long uh they're not they're not a yard long bean but um they've you know they get 18 inches or something and they still stay very small keep small beans um inside of the pod and stay tender and they have a great flavor so um, that's another variety that i really like so moving on along to the half runner beans so they are called that because they are kind of like halfway uh, between a bush and a pole uh, so a lot of people don't stake a half runner, they plant them more just like a bush bean, but they will get these long um, menacing trailers <laughs> on there. Uh, so you can see like in this photo, this is one bean plant, but it just keeps going on and on and on. And on this um, trailing part is where you're going to get the majority of your beans being set. So you don't want to necessarily prune that off or anything like that, but they can be fairly heavy producers, which is nice. Uh, and again, a lot of people really like the flavor of a half runner. They're more of like an old timey garden bean, uh, and they tend to be a little bit lighter in color. So they're more of a, a light green. I would say they're not nearly as, as dark as some of the new varieties like a Tenderette or a Blue Lake but good flavor. Uh, just remember they are going to have strings, so it's extra work whenever you are um, cleaning them to if you're going to preserve them or, you know, cook them for dinner. And then pole beans, just as the name suggests, again, they're going to grow up whatever structure um, you give them. They like strings. They like um, like the little um, A-frame structures that a lot of people used to uh, put in their garden to help save space. Uh, so they're a fun addition to the garden. And again, because you're just going to plant them once, uh, a lot of times they'll just continue to grow throughout most of the season and you'll be able to harvest beans at the bottom. And as you go along through the season, then you'll, um, you know, continue to harvest all the way up the trellis. Oh, and then these are uh, scarlet runner beans. So these are going to be very beautiful additions to your garden. Uh, they're going to have a bright red flower, which is attractive to a lot of beneficial insects and a beneficial um, pollinators like hummingbirds that maybe you wouldn't see traditionally in your vegetable garden that often. 
Uh, and they are a little bit longer in days. So, you know, closer to 80 days before you're going to be able to harvest these uh, beans. But again, the edible uh, pod uh, is just, it's a nice addition uh, to your garden. And then we have lima beans, uh, which can be grown either as bush or pole type. Uh, most of the time your bush limas are going to be a little bit more uh, reliable in, in production, especially if it gets warmer uh, or too warm in the season. Uh, I've grown bush limas before. Again, it's always a lot of work to me uh, whenever you're growing these these beans or peas that we're going to talk about in a little bit as shell. Uh, you get excited because you think, oh, this is a big pod. But then once you start to shell it out, it, it takes a lot of work, in my opinion, to, uh, to get enough for a mess, um, like for dinner or something like that. Um, but something fun to try um, if you've never grown uh, lima beans before. Uh, these are asparagus beans are also called yard long bean. Uh, they are related to the black eyed peas, so they're going to have a similar flavor uh, and the beans themselves, uh, they can get up to two feet long, which seems massive to me. Uh, so it wouldn't take very many of those long beans to uh, make a pan uh, for dinner, right? So they like warm temperatures and a long growing season in order to really produce well. Uh, and a lot of these are from other countries, uh, so they are more adapted, again, to longer growing seasons and on hot temperatures. Then we have fava beans, uh, or sometimes they're called broad beans, and they are more cold hardy, so they're better for cooler climates. Uh, they can be grown earlier in the spring, and they're not going to do quite as well in the heat of the summer. Uh, so you might even try planting them in the fall um, if you have a climate that's not going to get really harsh winters. So not Garrett County, but you know down east where it's a little bit more mild, uh, you might be able to get away with, with trying these in the fall. And then just a little bit about harvesting beans. Uh, so again, your snap beans or your bush beans, you're gonna wanna uh, pick them whenever the pods are still very tender. Again, before the bean completely fills out. Uh, if you're doing the shelling beans, like your lima beans or um, like your horticultural beans that you're gonna you know, pick for the, the actual bean itself, you'll wanna leave those on the vine for as long as possible. Uh, the longer you leave them on there and the drier they get, uh, the easier your job's going to be whenever you go to shell them out. Uh, so again, the longer for maturing or dried beans, uh, keep them on uh, until a frost or until the beans pretty well die. And the best way to preserve your beans is if you're going to keep them in the refrigerator, uh, you can keep them for up to one week in a perforated plastic bag, like in your crisper. Uh, again, they freeze very well, so you can trim the ends and clean them um, and snap them, blanch them in boiling water for one minute, and then uh, put them into ice water, uh, drain, and then you're ready to stick them in the freezer, um, and they'll last in there, you know, for several months. Then whenever you get them out, you can just cook them um, just like they were fresh out of your garden. And because they are a low acid vegetable, if you want to can them, they do need to be uh, done in a pressure canner. The so southern peas is another uh, plant uh, in a separate genus, uh, but in the same family. Uh, they're going to be used very similar to a, a pea. Uh, there's three common types. There's black-eyed peas, cream peas, and then crowder peas, uh, which I think are just beautiful. Uh, and they are going to be grown, again, very similar to the way we would grow green beans or bush beans. Uh, they do come in pole variety or bush form, so depending on whatever uh, would work best in your garden environment. You can try any of these three different types. Uh, and they can also even be used as a cover crop in the summer to help improve your soil. Again, because they are a legume, they're gonna help add those, those nutrients right back into the ground once uh, they are killed or plowed under. So now we're moving into the peas. Uh, these are, again, going to be more on the cool side of life. They like cooler temperatures in the spring, so they're one of the first plants that we can grow here in Garrett County. And there are basically three different varieties of peas. We have shell peas, where you're going to harvest just the pea inside and not eat the pod. We have snap peas, which are a cross between shell and snow. Uh, again, with the snap peas, they are the pod is edible, 
uh, but they're going to be kind of puffier, so they're going to look more like a shell pea. Uh, and a lot of times your snap peas are going to have a string on them, so if you're going to eat the pod and all, uh, you'll have to remove that string. And then the bottom photo is a picture of snow peas. Uh, so these are going to be ones that the pea itself uh, stays uh, very small in, and you're going to just basically eat the pod and pea all together, just like the snap peas, uh, but they tend to stay a little more tender and they don't often have nearly as many strings as your snap peas would. But again, snap and snow uh, are a lot of times people use those names interchangeably so it can get a little bit confusing. Uh, but just so you know the difference that snap and snow peas, you can definitely eat the pods on, uh, but your shell peas, you cannot. Um, it's good to, to remember that peas are best picked immediately before you're going to cook them for the best flavor. Uh, the longer you have them refrigerated or stored, uh, the more likely a lot of that sugar is going to turn to starch. So you're not going to get nearly as sweet of, um, of a fruit or vegetable. Uh, so it's not going to be quite as easy or as fun to eat. And remember, whenever you're picking the peas, um, it's really easy to damage the vines. So sometimes it's easier if you actually snip them off with pruners or scissors, uh, especially if you're gonna try to harvest them multiple times throughout the growing season. Uh, some more additional growing and care of peas. Uh, again, they are hardy, so seed them early in the season, but not too early. Uh, so that uh, the soil temperature uh, is, is gonna be in that, you know, 65 to 70 degree range, uh, but you don't want to put them out too early so that the flowers get killed with a killing frost. Just like with most vegetables, keeping them well watered uh, around the root zones can help them produce, as well as keeping, you know, weeds away from them because beans and peas have more of a fibrous root system um, instead of, you know, they have a smaller tap root, but a lot of the fibers are going to be there and they can be easily disrupted by uh, weeding too close to them. A little bit more. Uh, here are just a few more um, photos. Uh, the pea shoots are actually edible too, so you can add, you know, the tender part of the pea uh, plant uh, to salads and things like that if you're interested in doing that. So again, snow peas and sugar snap peas, uh, just for you to see photos of. And then there are lots of other plants that are edible. Uh, so garbanzo beans, lab lab, tepiary beans, pigeon pea, lentil, and fava beans. Uh, are also in the same family. And then we have some really pretty pictures from around the world. Sherry, do you wanna help me talk about these? Sure. Um, not that I know a whole lot about them. Uh, I have tried the winged bean before and it's kind of odd, but <laughs> you know, it's fun to try new things. Uh, it has a strange kind of cross section, almost like triangular, you know, but um, yeah, it was, it was okay flavor. And then I, I've never tried these Chinese red noodle beans, but they kind of look like the asparagus beans you showed earlier. I mean, they're a couple of feet long. Um, but what's neat about these particular red noodle beans is that they retain most of their color when you cook them. So they're not like the magic beans that turn green when you put them in the boiling water. So that could be fun to try that. Um, I'd never heard of a, a lab lab bean, but um, another name for that would be a hyacinth bean. And um, they are native to Africa, so they're an important staple there. But you do need to be careful not to let these um, get too mature because they can um, have some not so good um, chemical properties after that. So yeah, you don't want them to get too old because they can not be good. But anyway, they look, look pretty cool if you want to try some new stuff. And, um, and this slide, uh, if you'd like to do the, the dried beans, which like Ash, Ashley was saying, it is a lot of work to shell these beans. And I think that you need a lot of space to grow these in order to get um, a suitable amount um, to make it worth your while and time. But, you know, of course they have an extremely long shelf life. And if you have the space, I would definitely try these. And I mean, they are just, there's some beautiful beans out there. I mean, look at these, these seeds we have, the calypso on the um, left-hand corner that's, it's another name for it I saw was orca bean. So it kind of looks like an orca. Um, and then we have the Cherokee Trail of Tears being the dark black one down there. Jacob's Cattle is um, a popular one. And the Tiger's Eye, which is that kind of orangey color. 
and Christmas lima, which is very beautiful. I've never tried this, so I don't know what it looks like when you cook it up, but, um, and then tongues of fire, just, you know, you get these diff different colored model beans. It just can be very beautiful. Um, you could put them all together in a, a mason jar and you can kind of make a little gift at Christmas time with, you know, soup seasoning or something. And your, your friends and family will be amazed because they are beautiful. They are beautiful. That's for sure. And if anybody grows them, we want to see pictures of them. So send them to us. Send us your pictures. And also just uh, the flowers themselves are, are really pretty. And uh, it should be noted that beans do require pollination. So, you know, you're going to need to see lots of of good pollinators in your garden in order to um, get a good set of beans. Uh, so that's, you know, just be forewarned about that, that you will see a lot of bees in there moving around. Uh, and anything you can plant to help attract those pollinators and those um, animal pollinators like your bees and, and butterflies and, and that sort of thing. Any other flowers like marigolds, they can help ward off um, like nematodes, soil nematodes and that sort of thing. And uh, Sherry's gonna tell us all about integrated pest management here in just a couple slides. And with that, I think um, Sherry's going to talk about a nitrogen fixation, which we've talked a little bit about, and uh, the nitrogen cycle. Yeah, okay, so um, Ashley has been mentioning the fact that um, there are bacteria called rhizobia that are associated with legumes, beans and peas, and other plants in, in this family. And they have a kind of mutually beneficial relationship with the plants. And they're amazing in that they're able to take the nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Uh, most, our atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, if you didn't know that, and it's in the form of N2, which is unusable by plants. So these bacteria are able to take the, the N2 out of the atmosphere and then change it into a form that is usable by plants called ammonia, which is NH3. And um, this allows, of course, the plants need nitrogen. It's a very important nutrient. And in return, the plants kind of, um, they form uh, tissue around the bacteria, and protects them. And the bacteria also benefit by getting uh, a food source from the plant and uh, proteins. And um, it's just a really good situation all around, right? So it's pretty cool that um, these bacteria are able to do that. And um, if, if you were to happen to pull up like an alfalfa plant or a bean plant or a pea plant, and there, you see these little nodules on, on the roots. And if you were to um, you know, slice them in half, you could look at them and they should be a reddish or pinkish color. Um, and that would indicate that the bacteria are active. So pretty, pretty neat uh, symbiotic relationship there. Next slide. So I don't know if you've ever done this or thought about this or wondered how important it was. You probably have heard mention of it that um, sometimes beans and peas or you know, they may need to be inoculated. What does that mean? So it's actually um, coating the, the seeds with this bacteria, um, the rhizobia. And um, you can find this, it comes in a powder form and you can find it at gardening centers. I have found it in local nurseries. And I think I even found it, I may have found it at Walmart one time uh, or Lowe's. So you, you could check there too. And um, the way that I coat my, my beans or peas is by, the first thing I do is I, I take whatever I think I'm going to plant. I put it in a jar or a cup and I pour water on it and then I dump it all out so that the beans or peas are, you know, wet then I put them back in a cup and then I pour some of that powder in there and kind of shake it around and, and then it coats the, the seeds. And, and that works pretty well. Now, you may wonder, do I really have to do this? Um, I think that it improves your, the, you know, your pea germination or bean germination and, and their health, but I don't think it's necessary, especially if you have grown beans and peas in the same spot before, because likely there is some of that um, uh, rhizobia already there present in the soil that will then um, join up with your plant roots and, and be beneficial to them. So I think you can get along without it. 
um, but it's kind of like some extra insurance or if you've never planted beans and peas in a particular spot, you may want to consider doing that. Next slide. Right, and if I could just say, like, if you're going to do beans or peas in a container, uh, you may want to, you know, consider mm -hmm. doing this. I've never really done them in containers, but I think that they would work well, um, especially if you just want, you know, some early season that you're going to, you know, start off with a mess of, you know, beans or something like that. You could try inoculating your seed in, in that container. Yep, that also sounds like a good idea. So. I'm going to focus now on integrated pest management <clears throat> and um, basically what this next section is going to do is to talk to you about some organic methods for controlling um, pests and diseases, but integrated pest management strategies also include the use of chemicals. And of course, this is up to you um, whether you want to use chemicals or not. And there are reduced risk chemicals out there that you can choose to use. So, you know, people are always asking, you know, well, what are some organic gardening methods? And, and this is what all good gardeners should be doing in order to protect your environment and um, the soil and water and air quality and, you know, your, the health of your environment and especially your own family, right? So there are multiple strategies that we can use to help control pests and diseases, and that includes biological control, physical control, cultural control, and chemical control. And I'll go into uh, some details on, on each of these in the next few slides. So as you should always um, you know, try and plant the right plant in the right place, which means you need to do a little investigation and see what it is that your plant needs to be happy. And that includes um, soil, uh, type, moisture, temperature, hardiness zones, um, how much light they get. So you need, in order to have healthy plants, you need to put them in the right place. And of course you need to be concerned about soil health, adding organic matter every year, at least an inch, because um, your plants are taking up nutrients out of the soil and they need to be replaced. Um, let's go on to the next slide because we're going to talk more about these in the next few slides. So one thing that you can do, which would be considered a, um, a cultural um, method would be to plant plants such as flowers and herbs and maybe shrubs or whatever uh, that attract beneficial in insects. And when we talk about beneficial insects, we mean insects that will help to control those insects that we consider to be pests. So they would be natural enemies of the pest insects. So there's a variety of things that you can plant and you can integrate it into your vegetable beds or just have it planted in different parts of your yard. Um, but some examples would be mountain mint, anise hyssop, thyme, oregano, basil, basil dill, yarrow, zinnia, butterfly weed, um, borage, salvias, etc. So, I mean, just having a, a wide variety of different kinds of plants in your yard will help to attract beneficial uh, insects and birds and you know, all kinds of other creatures that can help to control your pest organisms. Next slide. So the other thing, um, so we're gonna focus on, on biological control. It's, um, it's creating a habitat, which I just talked about that is, um, going to lure those insects in and give them host plants and shelter and food sources so they want to be in your yard. And um, so yeah, this is a biological um, practice as well as it, you can consider it cultural too. But um, the other part of biological control is uh, would be with applying pesticides that um, focus on using either fungus or um, bacteria that are specific um, predators, so to speak, of the um, insect pests that you, you need to control. But with the um, attracting these beneficial insects to your yard, some that are, we're gonna highlight a couple here, some that are really good are um, green lacewings or any lacewing. And you'll see the picture of the lacewing here on the right. The adult um, feeds on nectar and pollen, but the larva, which you see on the left, is a voracious predator and it will eat all kinds of pest insects, so many soft-bodied insects, such as uh, white flies, aphids, 
Um, they'll eat the eggs of um, pest insects. Of Let's see what else is out there besides that. Oh, it's not coming to me, but there's plenty of soft-bodied insects out there that they will attack and eat. So it's good to attract some of these. Uh, lace wings tend to like cosmos, dill, fennel. Um, what else do they like? Um, Oh, I wrote it down somewhere and I can't see it. Uh, but many, many different kinds of yarrow was another one. So you can plant those and incorporate in your garden to attract these. Next slide. Another beneficial, or these actually several ones, uh, beneficial insects would be uh, lady beetles. You'll see in the, the bottom left-hand corner, the larva of a lady beetle, both adults and larva of uh, lady beetles. Uh, also like to eat aphids and other soft-bodied insects. So they're very good predators and you want to encourage them in your yard. Uh, assassin bugs are also great predators. Now the, um, the orb weaver spider, or spiders in general and praying mantis are kind of general feeders. So they will eat um, pest insects as well as beneficial insects, but you know, they're still good to have in your garden. Um, you want a full array of the, the web uh, out there and we'll go to the next slide. Okay, now we're gonna focus on some pest insects that you may find on your beans and peas. This one is particularly a problem for beans rather than peas. It's called the Mexican bean beetle. And you can see um, from the picture on the left, you can see the three, three stages of this um, bean beetle. It actually kind of looks, the adult looks like a, a lady beetle, but it's not. And it is um, a pest that comes uh, from South America, Mexico, and has spread throughout the United States. So you can see the adult, and then we have like the little yellow eggs on the one corner, and then the larva, which is a yellow kind of spiky looking, crazy looking thing over there on the left side. So they can cause a lot of damage to your beans. And if you don't um, keep, it in, keep it under control, they could, really, they could wipe out your beans. So I suggest that you do regular scouting by turning the leaves over to, to look for these eggs and the larva. Um, look for the damage on the top of the leaves. You start seeing holes or um, window painting, we call it, uh, skeletonizing. You, know, you wanna turn the leaves over and see if you can find some of these um, insect pests and then remove them. Um, so it's really just really important to to scout regularly so you can keep this under control. All right, next slide. Another real problem, I, I really haven't had a problem with Mexican bean beetles, but I know plenty of people have. But one thing I do have a problem with in my yard is Japanese beetles. Um, and I think they're a problem for most people. They, uh, the adults are what are feeding on your leaves and they will completely skeletonize your leaves and devour entire leaves. Now, the problem is with these is um, it's difficult to control the adults. Um, you can use some, some pesticides, but they're generally pesticides that kill everything. So I don't like to suggest using things like seven on these. I would rather suggest um, that if you can stand it, go out there and uh, manually remove them. Now for, for a farmer, this is just not you know, feasible, right? But if you have a small garden and you're not adverse to doing this, uh, this is a good way to help get these things under control. When I come home from work, I get a, a, a cup full of soapy water and it's evening time. So the beetles are becoming less active and I don't even have to touch them. All I have to do is touch the leaf near them and they have this behavior where they just drop off the leaf and you have the cup underneath and it, they just drop right into that soapy, soapy water and die. So that's one way to help keep them under control. There are other methods um, such as applying a milky spore or um, other things to your, to your soil. But the problem is your neighbors aren't doing that. So um, they can still come in from your neighbor's yard. So you have to weigh the cost and benefit of that, but it, it is a constant struggle. Next slide. Um, this is another one, brown marmorated stink bug. This is um, an exotic invasive insect that we've been dealing with, um, now I guess over 10 years now. Um, I don't, I see them every year, but 
they haven't gotten to the point where they're like wiping out my crops or anything. I will get some damage on the leaves and on the mostly on the bean pods themselves from from feeding. Um, <clears throat> it's it's workable, you know. I go out there and I scout, and if I see them, I'll I'll scoop them into the the soapy water. But I really think the best thing to do is to um, look under the leaves and look for the eggs and head the problem off before it starts. So. The, the brown marmorated stink bug will lay these eggs uh, on the underside of the leaves. They look kind of like little barrels and they're laid in rows. It's pretty um, distinctive and most stink bugs do this. Um, so you, you can uh, look for those and just remove the whole leaf, put it in the trash and help, you know, get rid of a bunch of bugs all at one time. Next slide. This just shows you um, the development of the uh, brown marmorated stink bug. And this is similar to all stink bugs. Um, you, you go from nymphs to adults and they just, the nymphs just kind of look like um, smaller adults. All right, so one other insect, you or actually it's not an insect, excuse me, um, organism you might have a problem with are spider mites. They are not insects. They are related to spiders. And uh, what they do is they, they have mouth parts that suck the, the chlorophyll out of the leaves. And so you'll see this stippling on the top part. Um, you know you have a bad problem if you turn the leaves over and you see webbing. They tend to thrive in hot, dry weather. Um, you can try and get them under control with horticultural oil or neem oil. Um, but I suggest you're spraying the plants with a hose. Uh, do it in the, in the morning so the leaves have time to dry later. But um, get the underside of the leaves and kind of knock them off and it creates a, a moisture environment and they don't like that. Next slide. Oh, here you see some picture of the spider mites. They're, one of the real common ones are um, two spotted uh, spider mites. We see European red ones here in the, in the photos. They're, they're real tiny things. Um, you probably need a hand lens to see them. And then all the white things on the, on the leaves are just their shed skins as they um, develop in move to the next stage of development. Okay, and this is a, a new one, which I have not seen um, out in Western Maryland, but we do have them in Southern Maryland and on the Eastern shore. This is another exotic invasive called the kudzu bug. Uh, it tends to be a real problem on soybean crops. Not one that we need to worry about at this point, but um, keep your eye out for it. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some physical ways to control insects, um, and that would be, you know, floating row covers, and we've talked about this in, in all of our presentations. It's just a really handy-dandy thing to help um, <clears throat> keep insects off of your, your plants. Now, if you have plants that flower and need um, to be pollinated, when they get to that point of development, you are going to need to remove the row cover so that you can get pollinators or at least open the two ends. You know, if you have it in like a tunnel, <clears throat> open either end so pollinators can, can get in. But they, uh, the row cover is really handy because it also provides some protection from frost as well as um, other predators such as deer and rabbits and birds. Um, Another physical barrier you could consider using would be this EnviroMesh in the, the lower left-hand corner. Um, it, it also will keep the insects and deer and rabbits off of your plants. Uh, you get good air circulation there, uh, but insects can't get into pollinate, so you will have to allow for that. And then this other um, slide, it's hard to see, but it has bird netting on that. And that will allow, um, some the pollinators to get in, uh, but it could help pr uh, protect your plants from deer and rabbits and, and birds. Next slide. So now we're going to move on to diseases. And uh, this is a, a general slide just to, to let you know what are some general practices that are going to help you to avoid or lessen diseases in all of your vegetables and plants and flowers and everything in your garden. So, so these, some, some basic principles are, to start out with, you want to get uh, disease resistant varieties, disease resistant certified seed. You wanna make sure that you have good air circulation around your plants. Uh, don't plant them too closely. Make sure they're getting the proper amount of sunshine that they need. Uh, for the most part, uh, we don't want to have sprinkler 
you know, water systems that are getting the leaves wet. If you are going to water, it's best to water um, the soil rather than the plant and to do it in the morning as opposed to the evening. Uh, if you water in the morning, it gives the plant the ability to have their leaves dried off before evening time when things get moister and cooler. Uh, diseases do tend to like moist, cool, or moist, warm environments. That's what they thrive in. Some other things you need to do, as, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, was to make sure you put the right plant in the right place. Um, mulch helps to reduce your disease issues. Um, let's see. Uh, another a really good thing is you know, scouting, which we talked about for insects. Also important to scout for diseases. If you start to see some disease issues, cut those leaf uh, leaves off and put them in the trash. So discard those um, diseased plant parts early so that they're not producing spores and spreading it to other plants. Um, and always a good garden sanitation is always important. Clean up at the end of the season because the fun fungus or bacteria can be uh, in that plant material and uh, provide a source for infection for the following season if you don't um, remove it. Next slide. So there are, there are several diseases of peas and beans, and I'm not going to go over them. We're just going to kind of look at these briefly. Um, diseases can be difficult to identify. And I also should say that um, most fungicides on the market for homeowners are um, protective rather than um, curative. So if, if you have a leaf like in this picture that it's got all these signs of disease, um, it's really too late to spray a fungicide. So you have to decide from the beginning, do I want to spray uh, and start at the beginning of the season and do it every couple of weeks and um, change up the types of fungicides that you use. And of course, always read the label, make sure you're following it exactly and that whatever you're spraying on the plant is labeled for that particular plant. So um, I actually, I don't do a lot of fungicide spraying. Um, I, I tend to cut off disease plant parts and dispose of them because I just can't be regular about spraying. And I also just don't like putting the chemicals on, but you have, you'll have to decide that for yourself. Um, so I would suggest if, if you really wanna know what a particular disease is, you can, uh, Google, uh, say, brown spots on my bean leaves and extension, um, or Google um, pea diseases and extension, and it will give you university research um, and good pictures that will help you decide or you know, figure out what it is that's wrong with your plants. Okay, so we'll move on to um, bacterial diseases. Uh, there's not a lot for beans and peas, but this is one that beans and peas share. It's called bacterial blight, um, and it creates these um, small water-soaked spots on the leaves that can eventually turn the leaves brown and may even girdle the stems. And you know, above that, the, some of the plant material is going to die. Um, this disease happens by, um, you know, comes across through infected seed. The bacterium can survive in the soil, so I suggest that you rotate to a different part of your garden if you end up having um, a bacterial problem. And it actually can, um, um, or excuse me, the management would be to, um, to rotate and to try, if you know you're gonna have, you have problems with this, have had problems with it in the past, you might wanna try and find a disease, uh, a disease mm, that particular disease resistant variety and disinfect your tools regularly. Next slide. Um, Another fungal disease of peas in particular is um, ampho, amphonomyces root rot or root rot. So you can see from the picture, the, the plant on the, the left-hand side is healthy. The root should look um, kind of whitish. Uh, on the left-hand, or excuse me, on the right-hand side is the diseased plant. And it's just basically gonna look stunted. It's not gonna be healthy. It's not gonna produce pods. That, there's not a well-developed root system there. And if you looked at the roots, they probably look brown. So that's, that's what this um, would indicate. And there aren't any fungicide controls for this. So the best thing to do is um, move it to a different part of your garden. Um, so wet, heavy soils 
kind of tend to favor this particular bacterial disease. Next slide. Another fungal disease of peas would be ascochyta disease. Um, with this, you'll see purple lesions on your pods and leaves. You might get a concentric ring pattern on there. Um, this disease favors high moisture. Uh, once again, rotate your crops and try to find a drier area to plant your peas. Next slide. And finally, we have um, powdery mildew, which is common to a lot of different plants. It, uh, this is one that I kind of struggle with, but I don't really see it till the end of the season. Um, it favors dry weather with cool nights that result in dew formation. Uh, and you'll get this, it looks like a white powdery or silvery covering on your leaves. Uh, what you can do is plant resistant varieties. Um, and, and this seems counterintuitive to me, but you can spray the plants, you know, with a strong stream of water to help kind of knock some of that fungus off. Um, but I would do it in the morning so it has time to dry for the, before the evening comes. Um, there are also some low risk uh, pesticides you can use such as neem oil, which will help keep this disease in, under control. Next slide. So now we're gonna look a little more at beans. Um, a fungal disease of beans will be alternaria leaf spot. And a lot of these are gonna have similar um, descriptions, but you've got small uh, irregular brown lesions on the leaves. Um, you can get some concentric rings on that. Your leaves are gonna turn brown and drop off. Um, this disease also is favored by high humidity and warm temperatures. Make sure you get good air circulation around your plants. Don't plant them too close together. Don't do overhead watering. Um, if you have a real problem, um, you may want to consider a, a fungicide, but once again, the fungicide, the fungicides that are available to homeowners um, tend to be preventative, not curative. Next slide. Uh, another disease of beans would be anthracnose. So you get these small dark brown uh, lesions, kind of roundish, ovalish. Um, they are sunken. You might have um, a purplish or red margin around that. Um, this disease is transmitted through infected seed. It can also survive in crop debris um, and in the soil. So you probably want to consider um, moving this crop to another part of your garden the next year. Next slide. Um, a bean rust. Uh, you may not have seen this, but um, rust I think are, are fine, I find interesting. Um, but they're very distinctive. This is one that you can easily identify. So the rust actually, uh, it forms a kind of um, a dark orange, bright orange, yellow, brownish, any of those colors, a pustule on the leaves and on the fruit of the plant. And um, the spores are uh, transported on the wind. Uh, you want to grow resistant varieties and remove and destroy all infected crops. Um, Weeds nearby can kind of be um, alternative hosts for rust. So you wanna keep your weeds down. Next slide. Uh, another one you may have seen would be a white mold. I've had a problem with this in the past when I've had incredibly wet, hot summers. Uh, I had my plants planted too closely together. They weren't getting enough air circulation. So you see this um, white cottony growth can be on the pods or on the stems. You know, I've seen it you know, near the, the soil line. Um, it kind of, you get these sunken lesions and they get slimy. So it can be, be an issue. This fungus can survive in the soil for five years or more. Um, the disease can be spread by the wind. So it can be a problem. So you wanna rotate, use wider row spacing um, and avoid excessive nitrogen fertilizing. Next slide. Okay, so I thank you so much for hanging on with us. Um, garden to table. Hey, these are a wonderful addition to your garden. I love eating fresh green beans. I can just come home from work, pick them off the, the vine and go inside and snap them and boil them up. I love putting some herbs in there with them. Delicious, wonderful. And I don't know if you noticed earlier, but I did put a link in there to uh, University of Georgia, National Center for Home Preservation, I think is um, the title. 
and they are kind of like the go-to for how to preserve your food. So if, if you have you know, excess vegetables or you're planning to preserve, that's a good resource for you. I think with that final yeah. slide. Yeah, we've got um, a couple more classes coming up. Um, next one's gonna be on cucurbits, my favorite. I don't know, winter squash, just make me happy. <laughs> You and, can have all of them, not my yeah. favorite. Yeah, and then the final one, which I think is really interesting is we're gonna talk about companion planting with flowers and herbs for your vegetables. And that's something we haven't really delved into a whole lot, but I think you'll enjoy that. And then Ashley's got some classes coming up in person, right? The, that's uh, right. Library. Yeah. At the Oakland Library. So if anybody's interested in that, please, um, <clears throat> please come. And with that, we are going to um, put up a couple poll questions for knowledge gained. If you would just be so kind as to um, take a minute and answer those, we would appreciate your time. And we do thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> this one we thought was going to be a short presentation, and here we are over an hour, Sherry. So we thought yeah. that Talk it was going to gonna be too, too skimpy on the information, but as always, we find plenty to talk about. Yeah. That's good though. That means we have lots of lots of cool things and hopefully new facts for people to, to learn about. So yeah, I hope you try some of those new bean varieties. I'm tempted to try those um those red Chinese really long beans. Now I forget the name of them. Yeah, yard long, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That is awesome. No, lots of fun beans. And again, they're easy. A lot of the diseases and pests are pretty minimal. So, you know, if, if, yeah, you, seems, if you've never grown them, then try them. I know. Um, you know, so I put put all those things in there because there are things that could possibly happen. But, you know, I really have not had a lot of disease issues. Um, and I think probably the most common thing I have is powdery mildew with the peas. Um, and you might get some leaf spotting on the beans, but it's never enough to really be worried about. And it's usually at the end of the season, you know, they're, they're senescing anyway, you know, getting ready to die. So I just don't really worry. But. Exactly. Right. Yes. I think that there's a lot of, you know, just getting out there and trying it. I think you'll, you'll gain a lot by adding beans or peas to your, to your vegetable garden. Well, thank you for doing the poll. We had a hundred percent participation. So thank you for that. And there was just a couple questions in the chat, Sherry, while you were talking. Um, okay. One about, can you just pour soapy water around your plants? And I said, no, mm -hmm. you really need to drown them. That's the whole point of the soap in the water. It's just to yeah. soak their wings so they can't fly out. Yeah, exactly. The The soap breaks the, um, the water tension and um, and I imagine, and also it's not healthy for the insects, but yeah, you have to put the insects in the soapy water. And there was one question about um, what's the difference, like how do, can you tell an Asian lady beetle versus uh, a good ladybird beetle? And I said color and spot, but I was kind of, and I said that, yeah. they will, that the Asian will, you know, they'll eat aphids too, so they're not really yeah. bad for our garden. No. Um, is it the native one has like an, an M kind of white M marking on the head? I, th I think, yeah. And they're usually a, a brighter red color. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, wonderful. Well, we will be um, sending out the link to the recording later this week, if nothing happens, and a PDF of the presentation. So you guys will have that for your notes. But as always, we appreciate your participation. And next Monday, we're, as Sherry said, we're going to be learning about Kirkabits. So I think that should be a really fun uh, yeah. class. With lots, of, lots of inspiring pictures, we hope, and, and flavors and uh, varieties to try with that one, too. Yeah, my favorite. All right, looking forward to seeing y'all later. Thank you for Have coming. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.